So let's just talk a little bit about designing hybrid storage. And I'll talk, we'll, we'll look a little bit at architecture before we just do it. Um, hybrid storage is the concept of using, you know, kind of front ending your, your slow spinning disk with a little SSD uh, to make current transactions fast right you know your reads and writes fast make them faster and um in the the high-end san um systems you know some of those controllers cost more than a new car a really nice new car so um here we just use commodity parts to to do the same thing that they do in the high-end enterprise storage building out hybrid storage now the the price of ssds these days and this is you know what up october mid-october 2014 um the, they come down like every week they it, it just seems like eventually we probably will just build stuff out of ssd but and you can with zfs you can just build this whole build all your pools out of ssd and that actually would be a reason that i may build more than one pool i might have an ssd pool and then a disk based pool for archive and run things like zfs send over there to you know kind of back it up on on spinning disk um but we can also build the idea so we can have ssd pools we can have spinning disk pools and then we can have this hybrid design um and and the reason that we can do this is because of the transactional nature of of zfs so we bundle up multiple requests io requests into a transaction all transactions and it's based on a copy on write design but the you know just kind of for the layman it just means that every transaction either completes or fails right we're always writing into free space and full transactions either complete or fail um and and everything is seen as a transaction but because zfs knows the difference in the different storage we can do some interesting things so here's our, our transactional design we might have a couple reads and a write and a you know get me the uh, uh, ls let me see some of the metadata all these things can get bundled up into this transaction engine um i i shorten it it's more complicated than that it's um i simplify that for this this course but it's you know just kind of basically pulling in what's what's coming in from the different data sets and then deciding what goes to what disk when we add a disk it's you know the very next write striped across that next disk now the system itself has the ability to then see that a synchronous write is different than a regular write or an asynchronous write. Um, a, a synchronous write, the application is saying somehow that this data is really important. I'll wait to make sure you get it, right? I'm going to make sure that this gets put into stable storage. The application developers wrote the application that said, write this to storage, but I'm going to sit here and wait and and make sure it got there before I continue. Um, this is kind of a big deal, especially virtual machine technology tends to want synchronous, right? Especially for boot disk, right? I'm gonna pull in a little bit. I'm, I wanna make sure that, um, that th my system boots correctly, right? I'm gonna load some in, make sure I get the next stuff. I actually, that's read, but, um, you know, I may have to write some information out during boot. I want to make sure that it got written out before I continue up up uh, my path. So synchronous writes typically are recommended for um, high-end virtual machine technology. So um, NFS and iSCSI are both uh, synchronous technology. If you look at like SIFS or AFP, those are asynchronous technology. Um, and so I could have, you know, different writes coming in from different places and the system itself will know that it's a synchronous write and it will go into the transaction engine and then the, the ZFS will log that information and um, log that that information is there and then tell the application to continue, you know, kind of I got this, I've got this in stable storage, go ahead and continue. What you can do then is you can add a log device and you can use SSD here to um, help enable the speed of synchronous write traffic. So if you're using NFS or iSCSI, good idea to have a log, log device. 
Now, the same is true with Read, but Read is a lot more elaborate. Um, by default, and I already talked about this a little bit, but the memory will cache everything it can. Um, the cache algorithm is actually very elegant. If you have some time to read up on it, it's very nice. It's not just your standard last in, last out, or first out, um, or first in, first out. Um, it actually uses two different multiple different algorithms for not just uh, last used or most frequently or most um, recently used. They also have most frequently used. So even if it wasn't the most recent thing that was um, used out of the memory, it also keeps tabs on things that you use all the time. Um, just as important to, to keep in cache. So very, very elegant design. Um, so you can kind of trust that, <laughs> but it will use all the memory that you can give it. So give it more memory. Now I used to say all the memory you can give it. I have seen systems with multiple terabytes of memory that there's a curve or a knee at the, the top end. Um, you know, you get and it depends on CPU and disc and everything else, but yeah, it, not all the memory you can give it a, a good, a lot, a good amount of memory. Um, there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there on the internet. Um, if you Google it, they'll be like, oh, well, you need one gigabyte of memory for every terabyte of a disk. Uh, that's kind of crazy. I can, I can manipulate my cache to fit what I have. So if I have 32 gig of memory and, you know, 500 terabytes of disk, I, I can, I can make that work. Um, so, um, the cache is very, uh, adaptive. Um, and there's also a lot of settings that I can tweak and turn around that. Again, a plug for my classes. I do teach uh, some performance basics on how to tweak those things. Now, I also, though, can, like, let's say I have a small memory. Let's say I have a 16 gig memory and I do want to cache a lot, especially for virtual machines. You typically, if I have 20 virtual machines and they're all, you know, running, you know, 10 gig um, disk space where they're, you know, the, te that 10 gig is getting hit all the time. Um, I have 10 of them, 10 gig. I might have a uh, hundred gigabyte kind of working set. I can extend the size of my memory out to SSD so that I'm not always going out to disk. If I have, you know, 5,400 RPM disk, I may just want to get a little bit of, of read cache here and extend my 32 gig of memory or my 16 gig of memory out to a place where it, it fits my working set, which I said, for example, is 100 gig. It, it's not that easy. I mean, the math is not that easy, but let's say, for example, I have 10 VMs each with, you know, 10 gig working set. Um, I need 100 gig of, of working space. I can size my system with that 16 gig of RAM and then fill in the rest of my arc with SSD. And I can put as many of them as I want in here. Um, I didn't say on the log disk. On the log disk, it's it's a good idea to mirror that just in case you lose power or you lose one, right? If I not that I lose power, but if I lose a disk, um, or I, you know, losing my log disk is not a good day. Um, now on my read cache, my read cache is always backed by disk. So if I lose my SSD for read cache in, you know, lately current, um, SSDs have gotten very reliable. Uh, there was a lot of worry when we first started looking at SSDs that they wouldn't be able to hold up commercial traffic, but there's all kinds of different SSDs out there. There's the, you know, MLC and the TLC and SLC. Um, so there's some that are better at read and some that are better at lots and lots of write traffic. They also, a lot of them do things like wear leveling inside of their frame. So we don't have to worry as much. Um, and so, but finding good SSD, the right SSD, um, when people ask me what to, to get, I, I say, usually stay with the big brand names. Um, you're, you're in pretty good shape. You get into the, you know, Intel's, the, um, Seagate's the, you know, the, the brands that are the household names, you're usually in pretty good shape, um, you know, coming off that path into the, you know, and I know there's a lot of them that are, you know, making a living out of flash, but, um, an SSD, um, if you're building your own SS, your own enterprise storage, keep with the, keep with the household names. 
Um, and, and for this read cache, I can, I can add as many of these as I want. I, like I said, I could, you know, if I, somebody was telling me they found a one terabyte SSD, that's interesting. You know, I could, you know, have four or five of those and, and have just a mass of cache going on here. So we can, um, extend the size of our memory by adding flash. So let me show you how to add a little bit of Zill and Arc to your pool. So I did this, don't do this at home, this is just demo, but I just did a little make file and I called my disks here, SSD 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, I do an LS minus L here. They're just files named that, they're not real SSD. Um, and again, if I had an SSD, it would look like just any other drive. It would have this nice big name here for uh, Solaris or um, Dev, whatever, in, in the different distros. So now if I want to do a Z pool add to big pool log, and I can say create a mirror of SSD1 and SSD2. Again, those are not the actual names. Now when I look at Z pool status minus V, you'll see now it says I have a mirrored log of my two SSDs down here. Now with the log space, there's a really nice, um, I think it's dtrace underneath and a script out there called Zillstat. Um, if you Google that, Zillstat, Z-I-L-S-T-A-T, it'll actually give you statistics about what's going on inside of your Zill, how big your Zill might need to be. Um, I always say add the SSDs after after you're kind of up and operational if you can afford to, um, just to see how big it is. I actually have not seen really big Zills. Um, they're usually in the like 100 meg um, area, even with you know like 10 NFS clients still in that 100 meg, 100 to 200 meg area. So typically your log space is small SSDs, small reliable SSDs though, SSDs that can take um, a lot of write activity. Now to add a cache device, we're going to just do, and I love how logical these are, Z pool add to big pool a cache that is disk, um, oh, I'm sorry, SSD uh, three and SSD four. So darn the bad luck, I can't fake it as easily as I want it. It's, it's actually asking me for a real disk. So here's a good time to see the, your disk names. I'm gonna go into format and just find my disk names. So I see C1, T2, D0, and C1, T3, and D0 are the two disks that I have. I've actually added these. These are little virtual box disks that I can use. I'll pick one and get out of here. So I'm going to use those to Z pool, add to my pool called big pool, a cache of C1, T2, D0, and C1, T3, D0. So I think it's good to show you an example here of using an actual real disk. Um, you kind of can see the, the naming conventions. Now when I do Z pool status, minus V, you'll see now that it shows my cache devices. And it's gonna uh, stripe across these. Um, again, if I lose a disk, I, you know, I, it, it's backed up by actual physical storage.